We left off two weeks ago with our study. We we're on the island of what? Off, uh, in the eastern part of the Mediterranean Sea. What island have we been on with, with, with Paul and Barnabas? Cyprus. And if you look at the east of coast of Cyprus, you find a, a Salamis, and that's where they came. And then on the western side of, of, of that particular island, you'll, you'll find Paphos. And we, we saw what happened. And there were two men that were important here. Sergius Paulus was a man of understanding. We talked about him. He had a desire to hear the word of God presented by Paul. But there was someone in the way of that. And his, his, his name was Elymas, bar Jesus. He was a sorcerer. And he wanted to not allow Sergius Paulus to hear the gospel. So there was a confrontation. And Paul did a miraculous thing upon Elymas. We talked about that. What did he do? It was a miracle. And you just couldn't believe it. But it happened. What was it? He struck him blind. <laughs> he struck him blind. He, well, that wasn't a miracle. Yeah, it was. He could see. And Apostle Paul, old man, he was, a, he was an enemy of righteousness, son of the devil. He was, all a, he was a vile man in the sense of, of want, not wanting the truth to spread. And we don't think about miracles being that way, but at a, at a moment said, you're going to be blind, and you're going to be blind for a season. It wasn't going to be forever. Because he stood in the place of allowing one man to hear the gospel. He wanted to take him from the faith, the Bible says. So we see in those first uh, uh, 12 verses, we see what we, we, were, we left him there. <laughs> we left Paul there. And now we, we pick up where he continues his, his first journey. But it's just a remarkable thing that sometimes we think of the miracles of Jesus, helping the sick, or the miracles of Paul, just helping the poor and helping the sick. And a lot of miracles were there to help the sick. But miracles confirmed the messenger. And what do we see in verse 12 when all of that was done? And here was the man of understanding, Sergius Paulus, seeing a sorcerer who was advocating great things. He has to be led away by others because he's blind. He can't see. What, did he, what do we see in verse 13? Then the proconsul, that's uh, Sergius Paulus, when he, when he saw what was done, believed. What's the purpose of miracles? To confirm the messenger so people can believe the message that they are presenting that is indeed from God. And this had to be from God because he just struck him blind. Only God could do that at a command of his messenger. So he, he saw what was done and he was being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. He heard the message of the gospel. What stood behind it? Confirmation that this is of the Lord. It's Paul. The teaching of Paul. Teaching of the Lord. Bringing forth the faith of the gospel. And there is, why are, why are, are miracles, they're, they're called powers, and they're called wonders, and they're called signs. Power, only God could be behind this. Wonderment? I can't believe this just happened. This guy was perfect, perfectly, he had his eyesight, he was very strong, he's had to be led away. Wonders? How, that's, that just doesn't happen every day. And thirdly, it signified that Paul was a messenger from God. David? Yeah, he sure did. So we have to depart there. We're going to be heading a little bit north and north, northwest as we, we continue. So we come to our, our next question. What did John Mark do in Perga? Remember, Paul and Barnabas pick him up as they were, were in Jerusalem, and they go to Antioch, then they go to Cyprus, and now they're heading north toward what we know today as Turkey. And we'll see uh, the events transpire there. What did John Mark do in Perga. That's, that's a quick trip, wasn't it? He went home. <laughs> he, he left them. 
And so we see in verse 13, the Lord and his company set sail from Paphos, came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John departed from them and returned to Jerusalem. Does he give you a reason? Does Luke give you a reason? No. So why do we want to kind of guess what it might be? But surely it wasn't a problem. It surely didn't say anything bad about John Mark. He just got, he just wanted to go home. And everything, he just went, he, he went back home. And we picked him up there in, in, in Acts the 12th chapter in his mother's house when Peter addressed himself to them and he, he was there, he just, went, he just went, went back home. We wouldn't know there's any problem there. We wouldn't know what the problem was. We still don't know. We can, we can put things together. But Paul had a big problem with it. To the point that when we come to the second journey, John Mark wasn't going with Paul. Barnabas said, yes, he is. No, he's not. And they had a very, uh, it wasn't a cordial thing, it wasn't just a group of ideas. It was bitter. In fact, they had to part from one another. And Paul took someone else and Barnabas took uh, John Mark. So it was difficult. It was something that was not befitting that Paul says he won't be with me anymore. And yet we fast forward what Christians do, people can change for the better. When Paul is facing death in prison, he said, bring John Mark with you, Timothy, because he is useful to me. And so it's a great thing. You don't overlook the error someone's doing. You don't overlook the, the thing. This is not good for you to do just because we want to just get along. And at the same time, at the end, when he sees changes, John Mark may, may mature us a lot, but he was you know, useful. There's a sense we don't have to stay bad and we're not automatically going to stay good. But there's a sense here that Paul had an open mind about him, even though he dealt with that problem. And while Luke doesn't record it now, we'll see it in, in a couple chapters where uh, it, is, it was a big deal why he left. Now, Authorities say he was afraid of robbers, afraid of what would happen. This is a mountainous terrain here in Turkey that he'll be involved with. He's there in Perga. The next stop will, will be in Antioch of, 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 of that, of, not of Syria, but, but Antioch of, of Sicily, they'll be up there. And uh, that was 120 miles away. And they were going to be traveling over land. And it very well could be difficult that there was terrain there and there were robbers. And someone says, well, whoever robs a preacher, he didn't have any money. Well, they might kill you to find out that you don't have any money. But a lot of times they, they would find out if you had some or not. But the, the, the thought is that that may be why he was young and he was fearful. And Paul is going to be stoned and left to death on this trip. But the idea of, of robbers has been come up. Otherwise, it was just the fear. Uh, what you get, you get homesick. You know, I, I think it was more than just wishing I was back there with my mom. But it was, it was uh, probably some idea of fear. We know Timothy. When Paul writes to Timothy, being a young man, he didn't give you. He didn't give you a spirit of fearfulness. Timothy may have been somewhat timid, and and uh, standing what he needs to do standing for truth and going through the difficulty. Fulfill your ministry and, and, and take on the persecutions of, of preaching the gospel, the sufferings, the persecutions of an evangelist. Get on with it. Go through what you have to go through. And a lot of times there'll be with that idea that I, I, love, I love you, Paul. I love the gospel. I love you, Barnabas. I love Jesus. But fear overtakes sometime our desire and our will to do things. On Sunday morning, we've been studying Jeremiah. Did that happen to those people? Fear overcomes faith. Here's what's going to be demanded of me. I believe, <laughs> no, I think I'll go my way. And as we saw in Jeremiah's day, they weren't supposed to flee to Egypt. Stay where you are. But we just assassinated the governor. Stay where you are. I will plant you. No one's going to interfere with you. I believe you, God. I thank you for, we, we pray to you and that's your answer. 
We saw that in Jeremiah. And so fear could be a very part of it, a part of our, our, our problem. Is that a problem today? Does fear interfere with our faith? Can that fear, so maybe fear being ostracized by family, if we take on that, that truth? We've seen our, the, the area of, of, of fear of, of coming, well, if I, if I assemble today, I'm going to kill my grandmother. We dealt with COVID. Part of that was trying to be recognized, this is a, this is a tough one. <laughs> this, this is very deadly. And, but we all actually said, I'm going to kill grandma if I go today. I think I'm going to stay home. And churches would not meet. And a lot of times, you know, there's precaution and there's no, nothing wrong with that. But to the point, some now don't meet as often as they did before COVID. They've gotten used to it not coming. And you begin to wonder, when is it that you're not going to be afraid of, of that? It's, it's no longer, that's not the, the problem. It's just the fact that now that's how we do church. That's how we do things. And it can take us away from meeting here as we should and, and uh, studying the Word of God every chance that we get. So fear, possibility. Of that, we, we do not know. But he left them. And Paul, does not, Paul is not going to forget that as he begins his, his next uh, next journey. How long was God giving the promised land to the Israelites? Now let me, this, this drops us down to verse 19. So let's, let's pick up when, when John Mark leaves them, we'll find that and they went, went to the synagogue. So John Mark's gone and they went to the synagogue and sat down and after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say all. Now, Luke leaves a lot of things out. How did they know that Paul and them wanted to preach and teach that day? Hey, anybody here got an exhortation? Is that the way it is? Where would they may have been seated? Jesus says, your Jewish leaders, they left the chief place in the synagogues. I don't think Paul and them were in the chief place of synagogues. They would know the Lord said, no, we're, going, we're not here to promote ourselves. But they very well could have been that we have a word of exhortation to give today because they're going to preach the gospel to them. And a synagogue was comprised of the Jews, but as we see in the first century, there were Greeks that had been converted to Judaism, and we know them as what? Starts with a P. Proselytes. They have been converted to the one God. And there's, there's the law of Moses. There's the Jewish people. And we see proselytes in Acts 2 when the gospel was preached to the Jews. We sit here as they go through these areas where Gentiles populated. But they had, they had turned to serve the one God from idolatry. And so he's, he's speaking to, to all of them. And, and there's, there's the point that he's, he's, he's going to be making. So they read the law. We think about the laws, the first five books of the Pentateuch. And the custom could have been that we read from the law, and then we read from the prophets, like Isaiah, like Jeremiah, like Hosea. Because they were all in place at that time in their scrolls. So they read something from the, from the law of Moses, maybe from Deuteronomy. Add one for that, and this laid down. Anybody got an exhortation to go from there? And so Paul stood up and beckoned them with a hand. I said, I've got something to say. And he begins to speak to them. And notice in verse 16 Men of Israel and ye that fear God. You Israelites here, men of Israel, but who are those that fear God? Well, that's Israelites. Or could it be, there's your proselytes. That's, that's the proselytes that we're talking about. When we get to chapter, uh, verse 25, um, we'll, we'll see that. I'll come back later on. But in this chapter, we'll, we'll see also the fact that, that, that those are your proselytes. The, that we reverence God. We're proselytes. And they were there, would be meeting with the Jews in the synagogue. And he says, the God of this people, Israel, he's distinguishing them, 
chose our fathers and exalted the people when they sojourned in the land of Egypt and with a high arm led them forth out of it. So he's taken, he's taken a history, give him a history lesson, exhortation. Here's what God has done. And with a high arm, I guess so, <laughs> divided the, the Red Sea and, and he delivered them from the Egyptian, with all, the, all of the plagues that came upon them. Finally killing the firstborn and said, get out of here, let him go. But it says about the time of 40 years as a nursing father buried him in the wilderness. We know from the Old Testament that they wandered in the wilderness 40 years, a year for every day that they were gone. And they spied out the land and said, we can't go get that. We can't take that land. And God said, yeah, you can. Caleb and Joshua stand for that. And this becomes important in our question here. Because this idea of having that land, that is the key to our next question. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, there's your Canaanites. They would be your Philistines. When he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land for inheritance for about how many years? You ever investigate that? Test it? Well, no, but he just said about. He's not exact. Well, that's true. But when you start looking at that, it doesn't fit a lot of times if you count the uh, time of coming out of Egypt. You've got 40 years there. And then we got another issue. Joshua didn't drive out all the seven nations. He began to do so. And while we're not told of uh, how many exact years that was, you kind of look at that. He was driving them out it, about 25 years as they were involved in driving them out. And they were, then they were taking that, that land. But they weren't completely driven out until the days of David. King Saul, King David. Paul will say Saul 40 years. We don't read that in the Old Testament. He was a king for 40 years. Saul, I mean, Paul knew, knew this. And then you had David rooted 40 years. It was coming toward the end of his time where the Philistines were finally destroyed. Remember, Saul lost his life fighting the Philistines. And they weren't conquered. They conquered them that day. But it took into the latter part of David's reign where he is involved in uh, finally destroying them and they weren't going to, to rise again. So turn, turn with me to, to 1 Kings. And we pick up in verse 1. It came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, which is the second month that he began to build the house of Jehovah. So here's something connected with the coming into the land. And we know by the time of, of Solomon's fourth year that uh, it had been 480 years from the time he starts building that house. So let's, let's, let's think about, let's take out the 40 years wandering in the wilderness. Let's say Paul is saying at the point of entering into the land and Joshua doing his work. We'll start there. 40, 40 years out of that. Take the 25 years of Joshua being involved with, uh, uh, we'll start with him and his 25 years. We'll take that up because he had finally completed the job of eliminating the seven nations that God, that Paul is stressing about here. And then just add the four years of Solomon's reign, because that didn't count. Because we know that David brought, brought an end to, uh, to the power of those nations in his, in his reign. And uh, she tracked that 29 for 480, you get 451. 
And you say, well, that's kind of arbitrary how you're kind of determining how it's going to be. Well, look at Acts 7.45 when Stephen preached. And notice what he says in verse 45 of, of Acts the seventh chapter. Which also our fathers in their turn brought in with Joshua when they entered in the possession of the nations that God thrust out before the face of their fathers unto the days of David. Is he thinking about going to the reign of David to finally destroy uh, was he, when he destroyed the, the Philistines? Stephen is re referring to that way. Couldn't Paul be doing the same way that it would be about 450 years? That indeed they were in the process of driving, God was in the process of driving out the nations, beginning with Joshua's work, and it would, it would come into the days of David? I think so. So when I, when I read that with those thoughts in, in mind, I see, well, Paul may have that same concept, and it, pretty close to it. 450 years. You take out Joshua's, all his work, you don't, you don't start with coming out of Exodus. When you, you might think that what, what we do when, when they destroyed the seven nations of the land of Canaan, he gave them their land for inheritance. He said for about 450 years, and after these things, he gave them judges unto Samuel. So he's taking us through David because that, that's kind of, that, that was taking out the seven nations. The Philistines were the ones that were persistent. And David took them out where they wouldn't would rise up again. So I think it is approximately 450 years. In fact, it's almost exact. Where those, they, they, they were getting, they were possessing the land, but it's driving out the nations. And God was involved in accomplishing that. And so they, they, asked, they asked for a king. So 450 years, approximately, is how long God was giving the promised land as the nations were being destroyed. And a lot of that was because they would not possess their possessions. They, 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 this has been distributed to you, but we don't drive them out. Caleb drove them out. He possessed his possession, but a lot of people weren't, and they, began to be a, they continue to be a problem. Philistines is exactly uh, one of those. Who asked for Israel's first king? Who wanted a king? The people did, right? God didn't want one. Uh, Samuel didn't want one. But what do the people say? They, they got a reason. First Samuel 8, 5. What did it say? Yes, sir. Yeah, but there was another reason. We usually say that, but there's, a, there's really a good reason why we need a king. Yes, sir. There's something else to it. That's not all of it. What does the Bible say? You're old. You're old. And your boys aren't faithful. And we want to be like the other nations. That sounds plausible, doesn't it? Do we have a president getting old? What are people saying today? We need, a, need another president. We need somebody new. Why? Because he's, he's old. And it doesn't seem to be handled too well. And that would be, oh, that's a pretty good reason. Well, Samuel, you're getting old, and your, your boys, are, they're not following the right way. And so we don't have anybody to, to look at here. We need a king, like the other nations, to rule over us. And that's exactly what, what was going to take place. Now we have who removed Israel's first king. God did. Notice what we see, how, they, verse 21, afterward they asked for a king. And it says, and, when he, and then in verse 22, and when he had removed him, they asked for a king. When he, who is he? God removed him. When God removed him, here paves the way for David, the king. And I just think it's interesting that, of course, God would tell Samuel, they're not rejecting you, Samuel, they're rejecting me, God says. But what did God do? Here's, here's the king that you're going to anoint, and God would appoint Saul. And for a while, Saul was good, but he, 
He became paranoid. He became one that didn't, that didn't follow the, the ways of God, and God took that kingship away. And that was, a, that was what, what happened to him. So they asked for a king, but God brings the kings down. He raises them up, and he brings them down. And that becomes uh, an important principle that we see in, 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 our, in our Bibles. Any questions or comments about that? All right, look at number nine, or look at number 10. In the eyes of God, who was David? He said, he raised up David to be their king, whom he bare witness and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse. What kind of man? That's right, a man after God's own heart. Who shall do all my will. And he speaks about of this man's seed, which hath God according to promise brought unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. Now, Paul is kind of jumps over history. He hits the high points. But we got them driving out the land. God gave you the land promise. David comes on the scene because he's going to finally, uh, in his reign, take the Philistines out. But also David is replacing Saul as king. And in contrast to Saul, he'll do all my will. Saul, you didn't do all my will. You didn't destroy Amalek. And that, that was the, the end for now, from that point onward, his kingdom was taken away, and David comes upon, upon the scene. So David is the one after a, man God, after a man after God's own heart. Was David perfect? Was he sinless? No. And what, what facts could you bring up that he wasn't perfect? He, 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 he wasn't sinless. What sticks out in your mind about David? With Bathsheba. Could it also be that he ate the showbread he wasn't supposed to eat? That could be too. He disobeyed God when he did that. And so it wasn't just one thing, but then that led to the fact of he's being complicit with his murder of uh, Bathsheba's uh, husband. So he said, well, that's wicked. That's bad, and it is. But here is the, the beginnings of, of David. No, we don't realize he's not perfect and not sinless. No one, no one is. But he was one that was going to do God's will. And David was one that did that. And when he finally admitted, I, I sinned. He, he, tried to, he tried to avoid it, just like people try to do that. He, he tried to make, make her husband think that they, they had the child together, brought him back. And, of course, the, the soldier was, I'll, I won't be with my wife. I'll, I'll be out in the field with my soldiers. And uh, finally just killed him. Had him killed in the battlefield. And uh, finally, Nathan said, thou art the man. And he had to give him a story about a fellow took one little ewe lamb. That's all he had. And one comes in to take all that. And finally, he gets the point. He said, I, I have sinned. And you read these Psalms where he's, he's convicted in his heart of, of his sin. And uh, he's still, a, he's a man of God's own heart that will finally get to there. But it was not, not perfect. And that's what he was in the eyes of God. And he's going to be the king that succeeds David. And of his seed comes whom? Jesus Christ. You wonder why you have all of those lineages in your New Testament. And the family tree, we would about, about call that. And you call the genealogy. Why do we study the genealogy? I can barely say their names. And it starts off, I want to read the book of Matthew. And you get over to Luke, the third chapter, and you, boom, you, gotta, you have all those names again. Why do we need that? And you ought to study them sometime. And you learn a lot of things. But the important thing was, it was important that Jesus was from the right lineage. Because why? The Old Testament prophets had prophesied that. And this was verification after generations, generations, and generations, and generations. And we said, I can't count them anymore. I don't know if he's of that family or not. I think they were. I don't know. But there would be a record and then connect Jesus with David. And all the events that took place in his birth to get him going to uh, where he's going to be in Bethlehem, the city of 
David. And all the things happening in the secular world, taxes, and those events taking place. God was saying the fullness of time. And you, Jesus came forth, born of a woman. Didn't say he's born of a man. It's a virgin birth. All those things were, were connected with, with the fact of, of fulfilled prophecy. Again, that is confirmation how, uh, that God has his fingerprint on history. Do you have control of what's going to happen 250 years from now? Well, yeah, you've got control of your money. You've got control of your family. You, got, you, you, you can make things happen. You don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what's happening tomorrow. But to have that kind of control and Jesus comes along and fulfills all of those prophecies. He's, he's of the right lineage. And yet the genealogies are different in Matthew and Luke. And yet he fits both of them perfectly. And then you begin there. Was he from Abraham's seed? Now David was. I'm from him. Jesus is from him. But it's from Abraham's seed. That becomes important in uh, this preaching as well. Especially when Paul writes to Galatians. Because he says, indeed, of, of being of Abraham's seed. Not seeds as plural, but seed as one. Holy Spirit is driving it home. And that seed is, is indeed uh, Jesus Christ of the, of the seed of, of Abraham. So, again, we're getting up other passages. But that's the point of, of David. And uh, he's of the right lineage. Jesus indeed, indeed was. What were the sure mercies of David? And, and you think, well, you're skipping a lot of this. I'm coming back to it because I got the next question. We'll deal with that. But I want us to see when we're speaking about David, let's come now down to verse 34. When he says, and as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption. He has spoken this wise, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. So what, tell me, what's that? And blessings of David. And, but there's a passage that will tell you, and it's found in the Old Testament. And it was written 700 years before Jesus came to this earth. And Jesus fulfilled it perfectly. What does that passage say? I'll give you the sure mercies of David. What is it? It's an everlasting covenant. My boss says that. There's my blessing. It's a covenant of God's promise to you, and you're going to be involved in submitting to the conditions of that covenant, and it's an everlasting covenant. It has eternal connections that will never end. Salvation from sin, the hope of heaven beyond the grave, the sure blessings of David, because through him would come indeed from his lineage, Jesus Christ would come the everlasting covenant. Did Jesus make a new covenant of God with the people through his gospel? Yes. The old covenant was, what? was, was, that, was done. He, he nailed that to the cross. And you don't have a testament until the death of the testator where Jesus died and set forth his will, his covenant into, into being which was connected with his resurrection and the preaching of the, of the gospel. So there's indeed the everlasting covenants there, and that's the sure mercies of David. That he said, because it's connected with David, just like Jesus is connected with David uh, coming from his seed. It also would be this eternal blessings that, that would come. In God's plan, what five factors had to occur before man could stand justified before God. And let's just divide it. Let's do God's part and let's do our part, man's part. And that's this section, God's part, that we're looking at. And so we... Anybody give me the five? Maybe I'm thinking that I got a look that maybe you didn't. 
you're waiting. <laughs> and it's okay. It's been, we've been two weeks and you maybe forgot. But the, the point is, is that I think this is important to get it, get it in, our, in our minds. When we think about what did God do? He killed Jesus. Put him in a tomb. Raised him from the dead. Paul preached the gospel. And people believe the testimony. And they can be righteous before God. See if those don't come to, to, to mind. When we, we look at Paul's sermon. Let's just pick up with verse 27 and 28. For they that dwell in Jerusalem and all the rulers, because they knew him not, nor the voice of the prophets, which are, ready, or, or, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning them. And so we, they just got to reading the law and the prophets in the synagogue. And we read that. They fulfilled them by condemning him. Though they found no cause of death in him, yet asked they or Pilate that he should, that he should be slain. So 27, 28, he's going to die. And that was prophesied by God. That's what God accomplished. Having him to die by the hands of rulers. And they didn't even know they're fulfilling the prophecy. All right, 29. And when they had fulfilled all things that were written of him, they took him down from the tree and they laid him where? They laid him on the side of the, of, of the road there and, and he, he got up. He, he, got, he just fainted. How do you know he's buried? They laid him where? In the tomb. He, he's going to rise on the third day. If you've been taking a pulse through day one, day two, he says, man's dead. And we sometimes think about why was that important? It is, it's because they, they know where they put him it, there and he's going to die. And then verse 30, God did what? He raised him from the dead. So here is indeed God's prophecy saying he'll come of David. But he died and he was buried and his resurrection took place. Without that, man could not be justified from, from their sins. Now, when he was raised from the dead, it answered another question. When was Jesus begotten? And I'm, I'm, do, I'm doing a bulletin article. You'll read about that, Lord willing, Sunday. And I said, when was the Son of God begotten? And if I'm looking at this passage, what's the answer? I know it's, no, it couldn't be. It's his resurrection, isn't it? It's Bethlehem, isn't it? What's Paul say? He raised up Jesus, as also it is written in the second Psalm, Thou art my son, and this day have I begotten thee. This day what? The resurrection. And so it turns yourself, what do we mean by begotten? What do you mean by the only begotten? Was Jesus... Only the son when he was born of Mary. And we sometimes think, well, he's a begotten son of God. That's when Jesus came that. Or was he always the begotten son of God? He never was anything else. The word became flesh, but you don't find the son of God becoming anything. Like he had to do something to become he, he never was the son of God and begotten just simply means he's the only begotten, unique, generated from God, the father. They've always had that relationship. And when you speak about the word, what does the John 1 say? In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. There's your, how can you be with if you're just one? You're with God and the word was God. He didn't say the word was the God. That'd make the father and the son having a problem of both being God. They, that he was God, just like the father is God, just like the Holy Spirit's God. So we get into areas where indeed the, the idea of the Trinity, and it's not found in the Bible, that's right. But the concept is this 
relationship of God is so glorious that he has these relationships and they've always been that way. You got another issue in Hebrews 5. Psalm 2 is fulfilled when he came high priest. This day have I begotten thee. And that demanded not his resurrection. It demanded resurrection to be high priest. And enter into heaven to be a high priest for us. So the Bible takes that phrase, this day have I begotten thee, and he puts it with connections of Jesus being raised from the dead and becoming our high priest and being indeed the purpose that the Son of God was to be. God, God accomplished that. And then we come back to verse 37. Whom he God raised and saw no corruption. Be it known unto you, therefore, brethren, that through this man is proclaimed unto you remission of sins. There's the preaching of the gospel. And every one of them that believeth, there's the fifth part of this, it believeth what is being said from, from, he says, he can be justified from all things, which he cannot be justified by what? That first covenant, the law of Moses. So what five things had to be accomplished before man could be justified from his sins? Part of it is what God has done, and part of it Paul preached, and we believe. Believe what? What he preached. And because we see preaching Christ and the conditions for us being saved, we can be justified. To think that God does it all, and, and a lot of people say, well, God, God made us believe because we've been chosen of God. And as if God made you believe, he, he, he gives you that. And uh, belief comes when we hear the word and accept it or not. And... Uh, Belief is a work of God. That's true. But how does it, well, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by what? Romans 10, 17. What did God produce? It didn't come from man. God produces the gospel that produces faith. We do the believing, and we are therefore going to be submitting to the conditions. We confess Jesus to be the Son of God. We are the ones that are being baptized, and that brings us into justification before God. Thank you. And those are the, the five things I had. Did you have anything similar to that? And that, that, that's what Paul is, is preaching to, preaching. And now he's going to have, uh, realize that, well, are, is everybody going, go, go, going to be able to accept that? And we'll start next time. What warning did Paul give his hearers? So he gave them the basis for them to be justified from their sins, but what if they don't accept it? And we'll talk about where the prophets talked about that as well. Any comments or, or questions you might have before we close? Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. Thank you for participating.